Good morning, church. It's good to see you. It is good to see you. It is good to be here. Let's stand and let's worship our Lord this morning. Okay, you do it. Our rock, the only solid ground. Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms, when strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. In all your wisdom, in love and justice, you will reign. Every knee will bow. We bring our expectation, our hope is anchored in your name. The name of Jesus. Oh, we trust the name of Jesus. Victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. Praise this morning, church. 
You may yeah. be seated as for it, just a moment. As we just as we just praise God and just proclaim His truth right there, right? Um, we got we got a young lady who is um, going to be doing that this morning as she just surrenders to self and and just does exactly what Scripture has called her to as as she's confessing, uh, repenting, and uh, believing, and now getting in this water and just just surrendering, just surrendering, just how Scripture just how Scripture tells us to. Uh, through baptism, and she, the, through that process, she's being covered in the, the blood of Christ and being washed clean. Um, today, uh, it, what, a, what a neat day is in store for us, church. Um, I'm going to leave part of that alone for later, but right now, we're just going to witness this together. This is Charlie, and this is Ashton, and, and Charlie's getting ready to uh, getting ready to baptize his, his daughter here, and Ashton, I'm going to ask you, we've already talked about this, so this is this is uh, from church camp. We're still working on stuff, okay? God's still working on stuff. Ashton, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And you're ready to surrender your life uh, through baptism to him today. All right, because of your confession of faith, I'm going to turn things over to, uh, to your dad here. Uh, Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 22, 6, uh, train up a child in the way they should go. You know, when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Our biggest job as parents is to make sure our children know who Jesus Christ is. Your confession, and I'll baptize you in the Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God, we thank you so much, God, that we that you don't require perfection from us, that you see us in our brokennesses, God. That you provided a way through Jesus, God. And your word is very clear that all who call his name confess, repent, and are baptized, that we live with that hope, that we are covered. In the blood of Christ, God, and that he is worthy, and that he was perfect, and that we can stand in your presence through him and him alone, God. I pray today as we continue just to celebrate, God, I pray for Ash, and I pray that you just protect her, that you use her. I just pray your Holy Spirit uh, on her life and, and into her, God. They'll just lead and guide and protect her. God, I pray that you would use her uh, to share the gospel uh, to her friends and to her community, God. God, I pray this morning that as we just continue just to praise your name, that you would just uh, sort our hearts, uh, comfort our souls, convict us where conviction needs to take place, encourage us where encouragement needs to take place, and that we will just proclaim your name and your truth. God, we love you. Your breath. 
God, amen. Amen. I spoke a word, you were singing over. have been so, so good to me, but I took a breath, you breathed your life in me, you have been so, so Oh! 
Father God, we just praise you and we thank you that, God, you chose us. You chose us first. And that you stand at the door and you knock. Lord, that you're ready to tell us the truth about who we are and how much you love us in spite of what we think or believe. That you're there to meet us in our hurt. You're there to meet us in our sin. You don't want us to try to do it on our own. You want to be a part of the healing process, God, and you're so good. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Uh, good to see your faces today. First through third grade, you can be dismissed. So going into first, second, and third grade, you guys can be dismissed for Children's Church. Um. <clears throat> As we get started here, uh, I'm not going to brag that we've been hanging out in a, in a better climate for the past week, some of us, okay? But it's very nice in Colorado where we just came from. Even on the rainy days, it was very nice. And I just want to tell you, thank you for, uh, for sending us out there. Thank you for sending us out there. just want to talk about it just, just, just for a minute. Um, so we, uh, we headed out uh, a week ago, just five, five of us youth groups, uh, tent camped on the side of a mountain together. Um, some of the things we experienced was we got, we got to get out and, and, and do some things that kind of press us out of our elements, uh, some rafting, some, some a lot of hiking. You got to get up and, and, and peak uh, o- over 12,000 foot elevation and you got to get up there where you can really see some things, right? And, and a hell storm moved in on us pretty aggressively and so now we're ready to get down off this mountain pretty, pretty quickly. And um, we uh we had some we had a team that that come went with us and 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 fed us good, and we had uh, we had a guy from Rocky Christian Church come out and spiritually fed us good, and we got to see some uh, uh, we got to see some baptisms right there and some some cold Colorado water, and um, we pressed in through the week to the parables of Christ's teaching on the lost, on the lost, and how. Maybe we're, we're the ones that lo- that's lost and need to hear that. And this morning, I just want to pray for you now. Um, that if you have not yet taken hold of what we've just seen take place, 
if that's not, if that's not taken place, there hasn't been surrender in your life, if there hasn't been uh, belief, confession, repentance, and, and baptism take place in your life, we're praying for you this morning. Don't leave this place. Don't leave this place without, without yielding to the urgency of that. We've spent a whole lot of our week coming to terms with our own laziness, our own self-centeredness, our own fears with going out and sharing and loving on the lost because that's the life that Jesus lived as he went out fully God and fully man and loved lost people and invited them in. And that's the life we're supposed to that's the life we're supposed to be living as Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ, that we live with a laser, kingdom-minded focus of living out the Great Commission. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sending us out, guys. It was great. I, uh, parents, thanks for uh, trusting your students with us. Uh, I, I pray that it was encouraging to them. I pray that it, that it grew them and challenged them that it made them aware of, of some things that maybe they weren't aware of before. Um, each week when we meet together this time, uh, we say our mission statement together, and I'm going to lead, lead us in that right now. It's being, bringing, and building. Being a light, bringing others to salvation in Christ, and building disciples. As we've looked at Scripture, we see that those things are the responsibility of every single person that claims the name of Christ, that we're getting out, that we're being a light to the community and people that we come in contact with. That we're, that we're bringing others to salvation in Christ by opening our mouths and sharing the gospel and sharing truths, okay? We don't save anybody. Jesus saves people. But we have an obligation as, as believers to be kingdom-minded people who are focused on sharing the good news, okay? The good news of, of Christ with those that don't know it. And then building disciples. And that is living and serving uh, together, studying together, uh, and going out and doing kingdom work together, and helping one another live out uh, that Christ likeness. Um, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't got, a, if you haven't downloaded the band app, get download the band app, create your profile. Um, you're looking for that DC Connect logo over there, so you have to type in all caps DC Connect. Join that band. That's where you're going to see uh, upcoming information and stuff like that, and our Core 52 stuff that we'll mention here in just a little bit. Um, we are going to work our way uh, towards communion today, so if you didn't grab a communion cup on your way in, that's okay. Just raise your hand when we get to that part of the service. Uh, somebody will bring one of those around to you. If you wouldn't mind throwing away your trash on the way out, that'd be great. Um, one of us will come back up. I'll come back up and close this out in prayer today. Uh, we'll reference uh, the chapter that correlates kind of for further study in the Core 52 book. If you haven't grabbed a copy of that book, um, we, would, uh, we would recommend it. We would recommend it as a, as a for further study and growth and kind of some devotional thought through the week. There's some copies of it back there. They're five bucks. Uh, if you got it, if you don't, don't worry about it. You can just stick your five bucks in one of the lock boxes on your way out. There's some cards in front of you. If, you're, if you haven't joined us before, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Let us know you're here. If, uh, if you're here and you, and you got a prayer, you got some prayer that needs or you got some needs, um, jot them down there. Um, we want to be praying for those. We want to we be helping you meet those. Um, if you need to have a conversation with one of us and this morning's not the time or you don't have a number, uh, just write it out there and you can drop those in the lock boxes by the glass double doors on your way out. And that's also the appropriate place to put offering. Um, with all that being said, um, I'm a little out of the routine. Okay. My stuff's still in a tote somewhere, still trying to, Chuck's still trying to figure out whose blanket's who, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, today, David, why don't you come on up? Uh, so if you haven't had an opportunity to get to know David McQueen yet, uh, he's been our summer intern, and possibly the reason that you haven't got to know him yet is because we've worked a dog out of him all summer, okay? And so what better to do than to travel for an entire week, get worn straight into the ground, get drug out to the mountains and camped. And I said, David, have you ever camped like this before? And no, sir. Okay, great. And you're going to preach tomorrow, okay? So buckle up, buddy. <laughs> and so he's here this morning. He's going to be preaching on none other than the Holy Spirit. So, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a big deal, right? That's kind of a big deal. And so um, be praying for, for David this morning. But I'm bringing all that up right now to let you know that um, even though you might not have had an opportunity to meet David yet, there's still some time this week. He's going to be here throughout the week. He is going to be taking off. This next week is his last week here. 
and he's got to take off to get back to uh, Indiana, go see family for a minute before he gets back in Bible college. Uh, so today, as he as he preaches, and that's kind of that's kind of you know the end of you know we're going to hang out. We got a couple more little things to do, but um, this is going to kind of start to conclude his time here. And we want to invite you to reach out to him uh, through band or through however, and just say, hey, Tuesday evening, we're we're we come over. We we want you to have you over. We want to take you out and. Let that be a, a conversation that will bless both him and you. But in the back of the room today, because we kind of starved him all summer, okay? He's used to that lush Indianapolis lifestyle. And I told him to bring work gloves and a headband when he comes to Kansas because we're going to be working all summer, and that's what he's been doing. Um, we are going to be taking up a love offering, or, or not, we're not going to really pass anything by, but there's a basket back there. Uh, I want to invite you to drop, drop a gift for him. Um, or you can just uh, drop it in the lock boxes out there. It'll make its way uh, either way. Um, but this morning, he's going to be he's going to be bringing the word. Okay, and so let's uh, let's pray for him. Let's pray for our morning, and then we'll watch the video and get ready to get started. Okay, God, uh, we just thank you for everything we just experienced uh, out in your creation, God. The way that uh, that your creation and getting out in the elements and and opening up your word, how it just it just presses on us. It just presses on us. It encourages us. It it convicts us. It changes us, God. God, I pray this morning that uh, as that you just work through David, God, as he just gets himself out of the way and just allows you and your word to work through him, God, that you would just bless us, that you would that you would convict us, that you would encourage us, God. God, we are grateful for your spirit. God, I pray this morning that if there's anyone here that has not yet accepted you, that if they've not accepted the truth of who you are and hope that they can freely have in you, as they surrender, as they confess, as they, as they believe, as they repent, God. God, I, I pray that this morning you would just work on their hearts, God. That they wouldn't be able to leave this place without taking care of the business that really matters for eternity, not just for today. God, I, I pray that you open the rest of our ears and our hearts, God. That we would begin to be led by your spirit. God, we just thank you for Jesus. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Yes, yes, all right, cool. So, if you were wondering why Jamie is a little bit younger, a little bit blonder, and a whole lot shorter, it's because I'm not him. So, yeah. Uh, like JB said, I'm David McQueen. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I've been serving here as uh, the intern uh, for the past eight weeks, working a lot with the student ministry. But this morning, I'm not just here for the students. I'm here for all of you. So lucky you. Buckle up. I just want to get right into what we're talking about because the Lord has some really good things to say this morning, but he also has a lot of things to say. And so I just want to hop right in, and I want to start by telling a story. So there was once a man who discovered what he called the Great Mountain. It was just this huge mountain, and so of course he called it the Great Mountain. And there, there, were, there were large hills around it, but none of them compared to the Great Mountain. It was unlike anything he had ever seen. It was powerful and majestic, but at the same time, it was welcoming. It was peaceful. And so when the man saw all of this, he realized, this is where I'm going to stay. This is where I want to stay. And so immediately, he built a house at the base of the Great Mountain, and that's where he lived alone. Now, a couple years after this, you have some mountain climbers who also come upon the Great Mountain. And rather than just staying at the base of it, they decide, we're going to climb it. We're going to climb the Great Mountain. And so that's exactly what they did. They climb the Great Mountain. And as they're coming back down, they, they're just raving on and on about how much better the Great Mountain was 
being at the top of it than being at the base of it. It, it, it was unlike anything they'd ever experienced. They were so, so excited. And as, as they were going on and on about this, they passed the house of the man who first discovered the great mountain. And the man, he overhears their conversation. But he's kind of confused. Because he doesn't understand how being at the top of the great mountain could be better than being at the base of it. It just it doesn't make any sense. It's already so great. And so the, the mountain climber's camp was pretty close to his house. And so he can hear them just talking on and on and on about this mountaintop experience. And eventually he can't stand it anymore. And so he goes over to the camp and he says, guys, how can you think that being at the top of the mountain is better than being at the base of it? It just it doesn't make any sense. And the climbers, they, uh, they kind of look at each other and they smile. They chuckle a little bit. And they answer him by asking a question. And they say, sir, how, uh, what, what could possibly make being at the base of the mountain better than being at the top of the mountain? And so the man decides to humor them by answering their question. And he says, well, at the base of the mountain, there's, there's a sense of security and peace. Why give that up? for the uncertainty and stress of a difficult climb. Besides, when you're on the mountain, you can't see the fullness of the mountain's greatness. So why give up that view? And the mountain climbers, they, they look at him. They said, well, why don't you climb the mountain with us and let us show you? And so hesitantly, the man agrees. He says, all right, I'll, I'll climb the mountain. And he was right. It, it was a difficult climb. It was, it was treacherous. And there, there were a lot of uh, moments of uncertainty. But the climb also wasn't without its rewards. Because the man, as he was climbing up, he realized he really loved being in this community with these other, cl other climbers. He had been living alone at the base of this mountain, but now he got to share this experience with these other people going up to the peak of the great mountain. Also, when he got to the top of it, he felt the sense of victory and rejuvenation. The adrenaline was pumping. He was like, yes, I did it. I got to the top of this mountain. But that wasn't the half of it. Because as he looked over the landscape out into the horizon, he was left utterly speechless. Because he realized that it wasn't the mountain itself that was just great, but also the view it gave of everything else. And so the man, he's looking out at the sunset, and the mountain climbers are kind of standing back a little bit, and they're, they're just waiting eagerly to hear his response. And so they say, so, is this better than, than being at the base of the mountain? And the man turns to them with tears in his eyes. And he says, no, it's better. Sometimes we get so caught up in something so great that we don't realize there's something better. And while it's true for material things, it's also true for spiritual things, it's a spiritual reality, particularly when it comes to how we interact with God or how we would like to interact with God. We say things like, Jesus, if I could only walk with you, I'd stop judging people. I would. I'd do it. Jesus, if I could only walk with you, I'd be more generous. I know I'd be more generous. If I could only, if I could only walk with you, Jesus, I'd be able to get over this anger problem. Jesus, if I could only walk with you, I'd be able to beat this addiction. I, I know it would be so much better if I, if I was just walking with you. And Jesus, he kind of looks at us and he goes, no. Jesus, what do you mean no? Of course it would be better for me to be with you, to be walking with you. And gently he replies, what would be better than you walking with me is for my spirit to be living within you. <laughs> okay, Jesus. Uh, you mean the Holy Spirit? Like, that, that, that guy who claims that he's God? Who, who doesn't talk a whole lot? Who, you, you can't really see him? He's kind of invisible? That guy? That spirit? And Jesus says, yes, that spirit. The spirit who is God, who does, in fact, speak, and who is visible. 
Sometimes we can be uncertain about the Holy Spirit because we figure, what could possibly be better than walking with Jesus? But I don't think we're the, we're the only ones who have felt this way. I think even the disciples felt this way when Jesus told them that he was leaving and the Holy Spirit would fill his place as, as their helper and as their advocate. But, but Jesus did assure them that it would be better, and eventually the disciples realized he was right. It was better. So my goal for us this morning is to come to that same conclusion, that the Holy Spirit is better than us walking with Jesus, that the Holy Spirit makes everything better. And in doing this, we're going to see that he helps us to be better, uh, better connected to God, to accept a better life, and also to be better equipped for our purpose. And so the, the sermon title for this morning is Better Believe It. Not just looking at the fact that the Holy Spirit is better than walking with Jesus, but why it's better, why it even matters. And so uh, we're going to be starting in John chapter 14. Now, We'll, we'll move out of John a little bit later, looking at some other New Testament texts. But for right now, we're going to be in John chapter 14, starting in verse 15. And the first thing we're going to look at is how the Holy Spirit helps us to be better connected to God. That when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, we're closer to God than if Jesus were standing right next to us. And this section of, of John we're looking at, it, it takes place right after Jesus announces to his disciples that he's going to leave. That he's, he's, he's going to go. But he's, he's going to be giving this advocate to, to those who are obedient to him and who love him. And that those who are obedient to him and love him will get this divine connection to God. So let's take a look at John chapter 14, starting in verse 15. It says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I also want to take a look at uh, verse 20. Just jump down a little bit. It says, On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Jesus didn't leave his, his believers to figure it out on their own. He, he sends this advocate. And when we say advocate, we're talking about someone who is a defender or a friend, a helper. And so he says another advocate because Jesus, he's the first advocate. He's our first advocate. But since Jesus, the first advocate, was leaving, he needed to send another advocate to, to remain with us permanently. And I'd like to illustrate how important filling this role is. So, you're skydiving, all right? Let's all imagine we're skydiving right now. Uh, no, okay. So, we're skydiving. It's your first time. You're, you've never been. And so, of course, you want to go tandem skydiving with an instructor. So, you get briefed. You're ready to go. And they take you up thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of miles above the ground. And so you're in this airplane, thousands of miles above the ground, and you're, you're ready to go. You're ready to get strapped in with your instructor and jump. But before you get strapped in, your instructor, he turns to you and he says, you know, I'd love to go on this adventure with you, but I got to go. I got to leave, and I can't take you where I'm going. So I am going to take this parachute. I don't have another one. There's not an instructor here to help you. Good luck. Can you, can you imagine the chaos and uncertainty that would be going on within us? We, we would be a mess. And Jesus knew that. He knew his believers, his followers, the people who were willing to jump with him, needed someone there to help them. They needed another advocate, someone to take his place as their instructor and as their advocate. Jesus didn't leave us hanging. However, this advocate would only be for those who would love and obey Jesus. And loving and obeying Jesus, package deal. You can't obey Jesus and not love him. And you can't love Jesus and not obey him. It just doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You can't separate the two. But those who, and, and for those who don't love or obey Jesus, they, 
They can't see the Spirit. They can't know the Spirit. They can't, they can't have the Spirit dwelling within them because the Spirit is the Spirit of truth, like it says in, in verse 17. And we live in a world of lies. So if people are of the world, they can't have the Spirit living within them because they're constantly working against the Spirit who is condemning the ways of the world. They, they can't be connected to God. However, verse 20 tells us that on that day, when those who love and obey Jesus receive the Holy Spirit, they're invited into this divine love circle of the Trinity, or triangle, I guess. We already know that the Father and the Son, they love us. The Father sent his Son to die for us, and the Son was the one who actually died, who chose to die for us. And so when we, who have the Spirit, love and obey God, who already loves us, we're welcomed into this, to, to this circle of divine love. Through the Holy Spirit, we're more connected to Jesus than if Jesus were standing right next to us in person. Because we participate in the unity of the Trinity through the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't make us God in any regard, but it does mean we are invited into that connection of love. But is it really that easy? If we just love and obey God, we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive that type of divine connection, well, essentially, there's a little more to it than that. And thankfully, Acts chapter 2 tells us exactly how to receive the Spirit. So that's where we're going to turn next. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and we'll be in verse 38. Acts chapter 2 tells us exactly how to receive the Holy Spirit. And it also reveals that receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit means we accept a better life. We receive the Holy Spirit accepting a better life through baptismal death. Now, the next piece of scripture we're looking at, uh, it, it, takes a, a, it takes place a little while after uh, John chapter 14. Because now, Jesus, he has died, he was buried, he has risen, and he has already ascended. And now we have the apostles, formerly the disciples, uh, giving this first gospel message. Peter, man, Peter has come a long way, disciple Peter, and he's giving us the first gospel message. And this is his final charge at the end of this message. Verse 38 says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who believe have a command to obey, and this command comes in two parts, repentance and baptism. And so repentance, it's essentially turning away from sin, and walking the opposite direction, which means if we're not turned towards sin and we're turned the other direction, we're walking towards God. So that, that's basically what it is. Repentance, turning away from sin and turning towards God, changing in a way that makes us look less like the world and more like Jesus. We turn from our laziness and we choose to serve others. We turn from our jealousy and we continually thank God for what we do have, what he has given us. We turn from our hatred, and we make, we make a deliberate effort to speak kind words to people, to love others. We are called to repent. And the second part of this command is to be baptized. And baptism is basically a visible, tangible way of confessing one's decision to follow Christ. But baptism also comes with a little bit of baggage that we need to address. First of all, uh, the word for baptism used here is baptizo, and that's what the Greek word is. And it means full immersion in water. So not sprinkling, not pouring, full immersion in water. And also, there's the requirement of choice. Repentance, it has to be a deliberate decision by the person repenting. I can't repent for any of you, and none of you can repent for me. And so... It's safe to assume that baptism, which is paired up with repentance, it has to be a deliberate decision as well, meaning no infant baptism. So infants, they can't make that decision on their own. They don't have that cognitive ability. And so it, it, there has to be a requirement of choice. And when believers repent and are baptized, they receive a couple rewards. The first reward mentioned is forgiveness of sins. 
Any sins that you have, gone, wiped clean. We are considered clean. We are considered holy and blameless in the eyes of God when we are baptized and we follow Christ. Now, in high school, I received a nickname. And I promise you, the backstory for this nickname is super underwhelming. If you really want to know the backstory, you can ask me after service, because I promise you, it is so underwhelming. So, the nickname was Dirty Dave. It, it, just, it just happened. And so, like, it, it's a term of endearment now for me, because I've, I've just lived with this through high school, and now it, it's followed me to college. But sometimes, that's how we feel. We feel dirty. You you insert your name, not Dave. Oh, I mean, I guess if your name is Dave, you can you can put your name in there. But dirty, fill in the blank. We feel dirty. But when we're baptized, gone. We are clean. We're not dirty. We're clean, considered holy and blameless in the eyes of God. And then the second reward is receiving the Holy Spirit. And baptism is the single way, the only way to receive the Holy Spirit. Sure, the Holy Spirit, it can influence us a little bit uh, if we haven't been baptized, but it can only influence us so much. We, we don't receive the indwelling presence of the Spirit or the ability to enter into that divine connection of love until we're baptized. It's kind of like scripture memorization. You can read your Bible real quick. You can go to church and, and read a little bit of scripture that we go over but it can only do so much until we memorize it and keep it in our hearts and let it change us. And in a similar way, the Holy Spirit can only do so much in our lives unless we receive him through baptism. So what? So what does it matter? Why is it important that we even have the Holy Spirit? What difference does it make, that divine connection, what, what difference does it make in our lives and in the lives of others? Well, as we look a little further in Acts chapter 2, we see that the Holy Spirit helps us to be better equipped for our purpose. The Spirit helps us to look more like Jesus, but also to be better prepared to show others who he is. And in, in this next part of scripture we're going to look at, it gives us a glimpse into the lives of some of the first Christian converts. And as we look at their lives, we're able to see how the Spirit works in and through them, which in turn helps us to see how the Spirit works in and through us today. Now, as we read uh, this little section, I want you to be looking for a couple things, uh, a few of the ways that the Spirit is influencing and equipping the new church. And here, here are the four things I want you guys to look at. Sanctification. Okay, everybody knows what that means, so we're good there. Power. Okay, sanctification. It's alignment with God's will. It's just a fancy way of saying alignment with God's will. So we have sanctification, power, guidance, and unity. Sanctification, power, guidance, and unity. And so starting in verse 42, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now we're going to jump around these verses a little bit, but I, I want to start by talking about sanctification. We'll go through those other three things, but we're going to start by talking about how the Holy Spirit equips us through sanctification. You see, in order for us to take Jesus to other people, we have to know him, we have to know his will ourselves. I can't tell you about someone I don't know, because I don't know them. That's how life works. And so, how do we get to know the God of the universe? Same way you get to know a friend. You spend time with him. So that's exactly what the believers did. Verse 42 tells us that the believers did things that helped them to grow closer to God and to know his will better. Listening to the apostles' teaching, spending time with other believers, taking part in communion, praying. 
They took steps toward Jesus. These verses, they show us a devotion to Christian lifestyle after conversion. They received the Holy Spirit and were allowing it to do its job. And we need to do the same thing. But that doesn't always happen, does it? We think it would be better to just let it go. We're willing to accept Jesus as our Savior. We're willing to accept the term Christian, but we're not as willing to let the Holy Spirit work in our lives and change us. Maybe it's because we don't want to let go of a particular sin. Feels good. We don't want to change. Maybe it's because we don't want to be held accountable for the change that needs to take place. We don't want to deal with that responsibility. Maybe it's just because we don't trust God. We don't think he has our best interest in mind. And so we choose to do things our own way. For whatever selfish reason, we think it's better to just leave it alone and remain unchanged. But guys, receiving the Holy Spirit and doing nothing with it is like taking a car key, putting it in the ignition, and not turning it. You got exactly what you need. But you ain't going nowhere. Now, I'm not saying that once you turn the key, everything's going to work out perfectly. Sanctification, it's a process. It takes time. But you can be sure that if you take the time to get to know Jesus by reading scripture, spending time in prayer, spending time with Jesus, you will look more like him. You will grow to know his will better. As we see in verse 47, the work of the Lord becomes visible to, to others through believers as they, as they allow the Holy Spirit to work in them and help them to be more aligned with God's will. And this is one of the other important roles of the Spirit. He helps us to be better equipped to serve and love others. And one of the ways he equips us is by giving us power. So we've got sanctification, and now we're on to power, our second part of the list. In verse 43, 43 we see that the apostles, they were turning heads because the Spirit was giving them the, the power to perform signs and miracles. And you'll say to me, David, or maybe Steve, depending on who you are, not once in my life have I ever seen a miracle. The closest thing I've seen to a miracle in my life is getting to El Pueblitos early on a Sunday morning. I've never seen a miracle. And for some of you, yeah. Yeah, you, you haven't. But for most of you in this room, here's my response. Want to bet? Want to bet? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Harley. Okay, I'll admit the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the ability to perform signs and miracles. And we don't have that. We don't have that ability. We can't perform miracles. Or can we? Maybe you've never thought about it this way, but the salvation of souls is a miracle in itself. It's someone's soul going from death to life. It's the resurrection of dead souls. And it's, it's a supernatural power made possible only by the Holy Spirit working through us. So if we take the gospel to someone else and they, they receive it and that they accept Christ, a, spirit, or a miracle was just performed through us, in that other person, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit equips us with power. Now the third thing, it also guides us. The Spirit also guides us. Verse 42 shows the apostles being guided by the Spirit in order to speak the right words to other believers. In verse 45, we see the Spirit leading others to act generously by giving things away, giving away property and possessions to those in need. And in verse 46, we see the Spirit, uh, he's guided believers towards the truth and helped them to find a joy unlike any other. He guides us in our words, in our actions, and towards the truth. But the Spirit, he also equips us for unity. So we've got sanctification, power, guidance, and now unity. Church unity in particular. Verse 44 says the believers had everything in common. Everything in common. They didn't have any differences. They got along perfectly. Can I go to that church? Well, what's actually meant here is that the believers 
They didn't regard anything as their own. The general attitude was, it's yours if you need it. They all lived by the fact that Jesus was what really mattered, not their own self-interest. And because of that, they were able to better love and serve others as a church. The Holy Spirit helped them to be better equipped for their purpose through church unity. And it makes everything about our relationship with God better. But that doesn't mean it's easy. Living for the Lord is difficult. And Jesus knew that. He lived for it. He died for it. But he rose again because he believed in it. Because he's the son of God. Jesus knew it was difficult. And so he came up with a better idea than walking with us. The spirit living within us. We've been welcomed into the Trinity's circle of divine love because we have the Holy Spirit living within us. And because of that connection, we're called to tell others about it. You know, I wish I could walk with Jesus. That would be pretty great. And one day, I will. But for right now, this is better. Because better connection to God means we're better equipped for our purpose. Better connection to God means we are better equipped for our purpose. The Holy Spirit makes everything better. Believe it. We're now going to transition to our time of communion. And for those of you who are baptized believers, it's a time to remember that Christ has he's died for us. And because of his death, because of his sacrifice, we get to be called holy and blameless. We get to enter into that divine connection of love. But it's also a time to remember how we have died to our old selves and risen to our new lives in Christ. And so, so during this time of communion, I encourage you to thank God for the incredible gift of the Spirit and the way he works in our lives. But I also encourage you to pray about how you can allow the Spirit to better work in you this next week this next month, this next year. And if you don't want the Holy Spirit to work in you, to change you, there's something to pray about right there. But because we are of the Spirit, we have been set free from sin and death and have risen to new life in Christ. So let's continue to celebrate that this morning as, as we take communion. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here at Deering Christian Church. Uh, with this incredible body of believers. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on your behalf. I pray that as we go through our lives, as we go through tomorrow and the next day and the day after that, we would allow your spirit to work through us. And remember that even if everything isn't going as it should, as we would like it to, we still have your spirit. We are still connected to you and that divine connection of love. Father, you are so good, and I pray that we would serve you and allow the Spirit to work in us as we go through our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, what, a, what a powerful uh, a message. Um, just talking through um, and looking at God's Word on the Holy Spirit on the Holy Spirit and how how it interacts with us and its purpose for us. Um, we kind of conclude today a little bit. David's just going to kind of be in the back of the room. Stop by, hackle him a little bit, okay? Um, like I said, his time is uh, drawn to a, to kind of an end with, with us in this internship uh, process. Uh, there's a basket back there and um, if you feel compelled uh, to, to give him a gift, um, uh, he'd very much appreciate it as he gets ready to uh, travel back home and see his family briefly before he dives back into his next semester of school. Um, but if nothing else, um, if you're a parent and he helped tuck your kids in at camp and helped teach and helped do a number of other things, just tell him thanks. Just tell him thanks. Uh, because the young man uh, served hard all summer. I'll tell you that even if you didn't get to know him. Um, let's stand <coughs> and let's, uh, 
this week, church, as we go out as, as Christians, let's proclaim the truth and understand that we are not living or doing it through our own power, but we, are, we, we have the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit inside of us as God's people, as baptized believers who have been washed in the blood of Christ, that, that we're living with that power. Here's my very pointed question. Are we doing anything with it? Because there's no, there's no question whether it's prompting us to care and to do anything about the lost that we come in contact with. There's no question about that. No question about that. This morning, we're going to just, I just want to plead with you for a second. That have you have not yet taken a hold of that hope and that power? Don't leave this place. Don't do it. Find somebody, find Jamie or myself or find somebody and have that conversation. We're, we're here for that and that baptistry is on. But I'm also going to plead with you that as you go out this week, understand that the lost matter to God. They matter to God. And yield yourself to the Holy Spirit as it's leading us to have conversations and love and serve people. Let's pray. God, we just, we just thank you for, uh, for your work in Ashton's life, God, and that we were able just to celebrate uh, that new beginning there, God, as she just reaches out to you. God, I, I pray this morning that if there's anyone here that has not yet accepted who your word proclaims that you are, God, that they would yield to that this morning, that maybe this morning they would begin to enter into that personal relationship, God. God, I, I pray for my brothers and sisters in the room, God, that uh, they would yield to your Holy Spirit, God. And whatever it is that, it, that you're calling them to. Out of their laziness, out of our selfishness, beyond our fears, God, that we would be a people, that we would be a church that would go out laser-focused on your kingdom, drawing others to you, God. God, we thank you so much for Jesus and the hope that we have in him, God. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Core 52, book 37, right, David? 37, 37 if you follow along for further study. Core 52, chapter 37.